Welcome to the Urban Capital Podcast, Intelligent Conversations with Marceline, London, Midlands, North. to start off by just sort of telling us um, who you are and um, it's a bit about your background in terms of your professional journey. Yeah, okay, I'm Michael Fuller. I, um, my background and career, it was in policing. I spent 34 years in the police. Uh, started off in the, the Metropolitan Police as a cadet, 16 and a half years old. Uh, rose through the ranks in quite difficult circumstances. But my upbringing, which is described in my book, a search for belonging uh, tells of the um, the challenges I faced in in growing up, both in terms of bereavement, uh, in, in terms of the, the the challenges and 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 issues around identity. They're all described in in the book itself, and and the the actual bereavements are even worse than I described in the book because um, whilst I was at university and, and Auntie Margaret had died. Um, the, my personal tutor, who was a psychologist, I was studying psychology, and I was um, seconded to, to university. He um, suffered terrible depression, which is quite ironic, because the whole idea was that I would go to this personal tutor with my problems, and he ended up taking his own life. And I, I, I realised something was wrong, because I would go to him to talk about my problems, and he'd spend more time talking about his problems and, and was obviously severely ill. And the, you know, that, that just added to the bereavement. And then my stepmother died as well. So there were three bereavements I suffered in about five years and, and made it very tough at the start of my early career. But, you know, I, I got through it. And, and that's the point that, you know, one does get through these things. And I was able to pursue and follow something I was very passionate about in joining the police. Um, and, and there are issues really about protection anyway. I mean, I've saw police officers dealing with incidents uh, without any protection at all. Um, and quite a disturbing thing I had happened to me where I saw a black guy collapse in the street. Um, clearly, I wasn't going to go near him, but I called an ambulance uh, for an ambulance and there weren't any ambulances available. And I said, well, I can't go near him. I haven't got any gloves or any protective equipment. And, you know, he, he might be suffering. I mean, the fortunate thing was I was able to shout to him and he um, and rouse him because he, he looked unconscious. He was right on his back. And he did, he did come round and um, I said to him to sit up. And somebody else took over because they were insistent on taking over. I don't know whether they knew him. And they, um, you know, they, they said they would wait, you know, in their car for an ambulance. So very disturbing, you know, that, um, the things that are going on. Mm. Uh, it was very much a new virus and a lot of the advice we were being given was in light of the you know what was known about the virus and the learning as as we've gone along mm. and and it's very different to the influenza a that we practiced and trained for so i think that's that's been the difficult thing and so much more highly contagious um, it seems as well um but yeah far reaching really um and that's something I don't think it was ever envisaged in terms of the, the impact of the lockdowns. And, and of course, you know, the, the, the black, the Bain communities being um, disproportionately affected uh, as well, which is, is, is new, really. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things that have come out of this and a lot of learning that will come out of it as well. I think a lot of people within the black community itself have, have become particularly, particularly alarmed by what they're hearing. Um, but I wonder if people realise that BAME encompasses so many different, you know, other ethnic backgrounds as well and different cultures. And it stretches to traveller communities, Romanian communities, Eastern European communities. It's not just the black community, is it? No, it isn't just the black community. And the, the, um, 
I mean, I, I've only been able to do what everybody else has done is, is just look at the faces, of, particularly amongst the health workers who died. Mm. But I've only been able to do that. So, you know, it clearly needs researching, but it needs researching urgently. I mean, what always happens with research is always done after the event. Mm. And I've said to a, a big foundation body, well, why don't we research these things at the time? Um, you know, because there might be some very obvious reasons. It might be the treatment of the patients, yeah. you know, whether they're yeah. class doctors or, or not. You know, it might be that there's differential treatment. I mean, you don't know until you research these things. And, you know, my view is the research could be started now. I, th I think there is. I, I mean, I was um, challenged on that because um, some of the people I was talking to at a, at a different forum said, well, there, there is research, ongoing research but not specifically into this issue. So, you know, my, my view would be best, you know, research it now than rather after the event, um, uh, you know, when yeah. you could have actually prevented deaths, you know? Yeah, so, and you know, the care profession as a whole, well, any care profession, so that goes from, you know, whether it's social services through to the NHS, um, we know that predominantly it will find black faces <laughs> or, you know, BAME faces in those, professions don't we so as you said that yeah. itself is probably going to have an impact on those numbers yeah probably probably is um and i mean that's a fair challenge but i mean the mm -hmm. the the worst thing is is when you get disproportionate deaths so you know why, why should there be disproportionate deaths i mean we've got to find the reason for that Uh, joining the police at the time I did in 1977 was a particular challenge because of the prevalence of racism, and we're talking overt racism. So there was huge amounts of, um, of racism, direct racism. Uh, some of that was directed towards me, um, either by other police colleagues or by people on the street. It was something I didn't expect and found that very difficult to, to deal with, not surprisingly. Um, that, that was very context-specific because... Uh, racism was commonplace. Uh, there were programs where people would, uh, television programs where people would use racist language. I'm thinking of the Alf Garnet shows, um, albeit that that was said to be satire. Um, the, some of the people um, would, would mimic the, um, the language used and, and mimic Alf Garnet in, in some of the abuse that they gave. So, um, you know, it, it was a, a very tough time, uh, particularly when I was at the lowest level of the police. Um, anyway, I, I overcame those challenges. I, I got promoted and promoted through the, the ranks. Um, I had people who were allies and lots of support as I went through the ranks and thoroughly enjoyed the, the police work, but didn't enjoy the, the, the racism um, that, that went with it. Um, and was an inevitable part of it, which I found quite strange uh, and, and quite wearing as well at times. The, um, I, I, when I reached um, the rank of Chief Constable, that, that was an experience in itself, which I hadn't described in the book. Um, but I, I, when I talk to audiences, I talk about Meghan Markle treatment. So uh, when I was appointed Chief Constable, I... Um, was really under siege from the media. I had paparazzi outside my house and some of them had long lenses and were in a park um, near my house, um, actually taking pictures and trying to get pictures of me and family members. Um, I uh, was also, um, my relatives in, in the Caribbean were, were doorstepped and journalists um, basically uh, were looking to get stories from them. Um, was this, was this, sorry, was this because they were shocked that you'd been appointed? Was it trying to dig up dirt? What was, what, what? Well, it was, a bit, it was a big deal at the time that you had a black chief constable. There'd never been one before. Um, so, you know, it, it was a big deal for the media. Um, they, they went on Friends Reunited as well, which was um, before runner to Facebook. And they tried, they, well, they didn't try, they contacted my former school friends uh, but the interesting thing about all of it is they weren't looking for positive stories um, because I got feedback from people who contacted me when they'd been contacted by the media. They were looking for negative stories 
um, about me and negative um, snippets of information uh, about me. Uh, and that was something I just didn't expect at all. And, you know, I, I was found quite shocking. Um, in, terms anyway, your, I mean, in terms of your predecessors, sorry, had any of those, it, to your knowledge, had any of those experienced no. that level? Wow. I'm not, I'm not aware of um, any um, colleagues who'd had the same treatment. I, I asked them at a meeting, a big meeting of chief constables, and thought that it was normal, that it, it wasn't at all, and that... Uh, most of the, well, in fact, all of the colleagues had said that they, they hadn't had that treatment. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that, that was quite a shock. Yeah. Anyway, I felt very positive about being pointed. So, um, you know, I, I brushed that off. But, you know, that, that, that was the start of the fact that I was going to be in the spotlight. Um, I ended up with um, four newspapers actually making up stories as well. So I ended up suing four newspapers successfully. They didn't have any defences. Wow. Um, and that um, they, you know, literally had made up stories or made up snippets of information because, um, you know, they, 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 there wasn't anything that, um, there wasn't any dirt, basically, for them to find. Mm. So, um, you know, it was quite a solitary experience, really, um, doing that high-profile role mm. uh, as, a, as a black person. And then, you know, the, the colour wasn't something I drew attention to. Uh, my, my concern was just getting on with the job and doing the job. It must have had a, a huge impact on your family as well, I'd imagine. Yeah, it did, yeah. Well, I think they found it very frightening. And, um, you know, because I, I was elated at getting the job. But, you know, because of the, the, the media side of the, and the attention, it made it very frightening for, for the family. And, and I mean frightening in terms of the, um, you know, there were all sorts of requests to do family things, um, for example, documentaries on at home with the Fullers and on a holiday with the Fullers. But the, 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 the actual media scrutiny and having journalists outside your house was something I just never envisaged at all. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I was a civil, you know, a, a public servant. You know, I wasn't a celebrity figure and I just didn't expect the sort of celebrity treatment or want it. Um, you know, I was, I was very keen about just getting on with the job. So um, whilst I've always had a very good relationship and positive relationship with the media and work with them, because you have to in policing, uh, I didn't expect that treatment at all. And I was aware constantly for the whole of the six years I did the job that I was under constant media scrutiny. You know, if I said anything, um, the, you know, it, it would be heavily scrutinised and publicised. Um, it, it was always a big deal, whatever I did. Um, now, that, that can be positive, um, but it also can be negative because it was generally what I did was looked at with a very critical eye. Um, the, the, the one thing I should say, which is really important, is I got huge public support um, personally, and I think that's what made it all worthwhile. So I had a lot of people write to me before I started the job, uh, churches in Kent, um, write to me and, and I should say um, the you know a lot of people said I would never get the job because there weren't any black faces in Kent which there are but I mean they're, they're, you know there aren't many and a lot of people said I wouldn't get the job but I mean you couldn't have wanted a more warm reception and response from the local mm. people when I was in the job I got a very warm response you know even, even bigger response and I used to do a lot to go out to the public uh, go on radio every three or four months and the and, and when I left, you know, there, there was lots of thanks as well. I've actually kept all the letters. I should have had them with me. But, you know, thick files of letters, which I can't oh, throw wow. away, uh, because they, they just mean so much to me. And they meant a lot to me at the start. Yeah. I, you know, it's very daunting um, being the first black chief constable. And you didn't want to fail. But then there were a lot of other people who didn't want me to fail and who made things as easy as possible for me to succeed in the role. And I absolutely loved it, absolutely loved it. So I did the maximum amount of time that I could do. And then I joined the, um, joined the Crown, I, I qualified as a lawyer, because I thought, well, you know, what am I gonna do next? So I qualified as a lawyer, which um, evoked a lot of study, five years of, of study, whilst I was um, Chief Constable and before. Wow. Uh, yes. And I was always, I didn't think I'd get to Chief Constable, you know, um, I just didn't think it would happen. Uh, and I remember talking to a boss about it, and they said, well, there aren't any black chief constables, so, you know, best you think of something else. 
So, um, yeah, I did. <laughs> but life's very difficult, isn't it? You plan things and, you, uh, and, and it, it just shows, you know, I mean, what it showed me is that you should never close down uh, your mind to opportunities. You know, yeah. you, you should be open to, to yeah. opportunities and, and not be blind to them. You know, they, they are there and they are out there. Um, so, yeah, one, one needs to have a positive mindset. I, I suppose that mindset um, um, set uh, inside you very early on in life with the, yeah. the challenges you, you face growing up and um, uh, growing up in foster care. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's spot on, actually, Sean, because um, um, you, if you know the book, which you obviously do, the, I was told not to join the police. You know, um, I mean, everybody of any influence in my life, and we're talking about school friends who I love dearly, my um, biological parents who I didn't have anything to do, but also, um, gosh, ev everybody and anybody said, don't join the police. You know, now is not the time to join the police. You'll experience lots of racism. You'll have a hard time and you mustn't do it. So, um you know, it, it, I, I was only 16 at the time, you know, when I was thinking about what I was going to do with my life. And I had all these very influential people, albeit the most influential pe person was the, the woman, Auntie Margaret, who, who brought me up from the age of 18 and a half months in care. So I spent all my, my early life in care being brought up by her. She was the only one who supported my decision to, to, to join the police. And you'll know if you read the book that sadly at thir the age of 30, um, she, she died of ovarian cancer. Um, but I was able to tell her that I'd been selected to, to join the police. And she died about two hours after I told her. Um, so I was able to run to the hospital and tell her that I'd got in. I was absolutely thrilled. And, and so was she. Um, but it was almost as if she'd hung on to wait, you know, the outcome of, of the interview decision. So you know, it just shows if you have a passion, and I was passionate about the work, um, the, you know, you, you must follow that passion and not be deterred by the doubters and people saying don't do it. You know, that, that, that's been a big life lesson for me. And, and if it wasn't for you joining the police, um, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have things like the Black Police Association or, or, or Trident because you, you were instrumental in, in all of that. Yeah, I mean, I can categorically say, and that's why it's in the book, because I wanted to, due credit. So um, whilst I wasn't the only person who set up the Black Police Association, I was the founding chair. And it took me a long time to get the minutes to prove it to lots of other people. A lot of other people have claimed, you know, that they, uh, lots of other people have been chairs since the, the founding chair. And one, one of the things I took was a personal risk in that I was involved in setting up this organisation over a year. And we didn't know how the organization, the, the Met at the time, of 30,000 staff, how it would respond to this organization being set up. Now, the thing is, it was seen as an, a union. Um, and a lot of uh, white colleagues said to me, well, you don't need a, a group because you, um, you've already got the police federation. And I said, well, that doesn't really provide support in the way that support is needed for, for, for BAME officers. Now, they didn't see that, but, but I did, and, and lots of other BAME officers saw that quite clearly. But they, they saw it very much as a threat. You know, it was seen as a threat, you know, all these BAME people getting together, you know, what are they doing? There was lots of suspicion. And, and the one thing that made the difference was the, the man, and it was a man at the top, um, said, um, and it was done informally, but the message was got to me, the, the commissioner of the day supported what I was doing. Um, and, you know, and that, that was quite important because I thought I'd be out of the job actually. Doing. But they, because at the time, and this, this is a crucial thing, there were more BAME officers leaving than actually joining. So it was quite, oft, quite obvious to everybody that if that trajectory had continued, that there would not have been any BAME staff. And certainly I would have left, you know, because I was having a hard time. You know, mm. the vast majority of people do cooperate with the police. They want the police. Uh, they support the police. Uh, and that was the case even in Brixton, you know. Mm. Um, 
you know, the, the rioters were in a minority, really, but there were a large yeah. number. The, the vast majority of people who didn't want to be involved in tackling the police. And, and as I described, the devastation uh, of the area afterwards was, was just, um, just so, so sad. Mm. I remember yeah. at uh, school there was a book called Lady Chatterley's Lover. Yeah. And the, you weren't, you, the English literature teacher wouldn't let us read it. So you'd have it under the table and you'd be reading it in class. But yeah, blimey, if she'd caught you reading it, you'd be suspended. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yeah, and it's a bit like that, you know. Yeah. The one, you can't be seen. <laughs> but I, yeah. the, the, the whole point of it was to inspire other people. I mean, every year when there's Black History Month, I get lots of young people or university students contact me and say, um, you know, tell me about your career. And it, and it does lay a lot out in terms of what I faced. And a lot of people aren't aware of the fact I was brought up in care. So I, I spoke to a group of young people who didn't want to listen to me. And, um, in uh, the, <laughs> the start, it didn't go well at the start because they were all looking on their phones. And they were saying to the tutor, why have we got to listen to him? And they said, oh, do we have to? And, and there was all that sort of attitude. And then um, I mentioned at the very start of the talk, having got, you know, a, a bit of silence to be able to talk. And I said, I was brought up in care. And they all looked. And then I brushed over it. I said, but I'm not going to dwell on that. They said, no, 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 you've got to tell us about that. Yeah. And they, they'd assumed that I'd had a very privileged upbringing. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd gone, you know, on the fast track and in the police and had a very privileged time. And of course, the real story couldn't be anything from the, the you know, the, you know, from the truth. Mm. But yeah, the, the the kill the black one first was the most frightening time I'd ever face, because um, you know I, I just knew the fact that we we were going to win, um, and a lot of uh, quite a few officers who were on that bus left the police because they didn't like the being put in such a vulnerable situation. Wow. They ended up being disillusioned afterwards. So, um, yeah, it, it was very frightening. It, it comes from the prologue where I describe the, the incident. And what I was trying to get over, and it's better explained further into the book, is my naivety, really, facing a new situation, never having faced a situation like that before, having helped poor and marginalised people the, the day before. I just didn't expect I'd be in a situation where I felt my life was at risk. You know, I, I really didn't expect that at all. And also dealing with riots was very new. I mean, that we um, had been trained at training school with people throwing wooden bricks at us. But, you know, not, not actual petrol bombs. That, that was very new in terms of the violence we faced. And I think what I felt is that you, you know, we, we really do police by consent. I mean, if this mob had wanted to overrun us, they, they could have done. But, it, it, you know, we really do police by consent. We... There, was, there were only 30 of us, and that, um, there, there were a lot more rioters. Um, and I felt, you know, the, when, when that uh, phrase was shouted at me, the, the guy who shouted it really meant it. it was, such was the anger and hostility. I also didn't understand why this hostility was being directed at me. Um, you know, I didn't really understand that. And so many black people had said, you know, we want people... We want black people in the police. We want the police to look like us. Um, I, I didn't understand why there was so much hatred directed to me personally. I mean, the incident that the guy being thrown through the shop window was, was funny. Um, you know, it, it did happen. And the, the, unfortunately, the, the person concerned didn't want to be identified because uh, he was quite embarrassed about the whole thing. I mean, fortunately, he wasn't seriously hurt. But it, it, but it was an amusing incident and, you know, it added, added some really light-hearted note into something that was very, very frightening. Yeah. Um, and, and I think some of it was about his naivety in the situation we were in and thinking that just because he would use his Oxbridge accent in telling these kids to behave themselves, <laughs> that they, they would do it. Um, and they didn't. So, um, yeah, I mean, that really happened. Um, and as I said, a part of the research, I did two years of research into the book I spoke to a lot of people who'd been involved in the instance, including people who'd been racist as well, actually. And, and one of the guys, quite an interesting story, where he um, had written a book, um, the, not for publication, um, but his family, he felt very guilty about some of the racism 
some of the language he'd use, how he treated and bullied um, a black officer and said he'd be keeping the book um, in a safe for when he died to give to wow. his family. I mean, I, I was really sort of itching to have a look and see what it was about, but he, there's no way he was going to um, share it with me. Um, and he was definitely a changed person. He, he turned to God and uh, uh, written the book, really, out, out of guilt and, and to assuage his guilt um, in terms of the way he behaved. Um, so that, that was quite a positive thing, really, that somebody who was an ardent racist was actually, you know, we're talking 20 years later, a very, very different person. And, and what's the post-traumatic impact like for you as a, you know, for, for, as a police officer? And now, particularly that perhaps that you've left force and had time to step back and look at it from a different perspective yet again, what, is, is there any post-traumatic sort of impact that it has on you? I think, I think the, the, the Brixton, the, the memories are, are, very, um, are very graphic. You know, the, the memories of the incident are very graphic and, and the level of detail. Um, but, I mean, the, in terms of it being post-traumatic, it hasn't been post-traumatic. I, mean, you know, I don't feel that I've suffered trauma in the way that lots of, lots of officers still have trauma. Yeah. I, I don't think um, the, the post-traumatic impact was, was, was as actually was, was more from childhood um, incidents. And I think the, the thing about actually researching the book was that a lot of the memories are very buried. You know, we're, we're deep, sorry, deeply buried. Um, and then because I was actually trying really hard to recollect what happened at particular times, uh, and we're talking more in childhood, the, once the memories had surfaced, and they would surface about one in the morning, which was very inconvenient, um, but I would have very graphic pictures of things that happen, positive or negative things, but some of them positive, uh, about one in the morning, and it was quite filmic. So some people say the book's quite filmic, and that's because how I, I recall the, the memories. Yeah. Um, and that, um, yeah, the, 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 the problem with that is you, you basically um, raise the recall the memories, and you do the recall, and some of the things are really unpleasant. and then really you 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 should have some sort of therapy to to help you deal with those memories um i didn't as it happened but i went through quite a difficult time the very mixed emotions about all these memories and and not being able to do anything with the unpleasant memories yeah um a lot of the unpleasant memories around bereavement sort of wondering what had happened there, there are still lots of gaps in terms of what happened i, I knew very little about this auntie margaret who brought me up to all my early life and was very intrigued and asked lots of people um, about her. And I've still found very little information about her. And, and we're talking about from the other children as well as other adults who, who work with her. She was a very, very private person. Yeah. So um, all, all those things sort of came up and were very much a part of my life for two years whilst I was doing the research for the book before I did any writing. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it made it quite disturbing. But I, I've, When I was growing up, there were very few black role models. You know, uh, for me, you're, you're one of my greatest role models. There were no black police officers that I could identify with. And, and again, when I wanted to join, it was a big no, flat no, from my family. And I was very unsupported. Um, Your um, father wasn't around. Um, so there was obviously a, a clear lack of role models for you, I'd assume, when you were growing up, or I did, I did have regular contact with my father, and he was right. a role model, but he wasn't. <laughs> right. I, I would say he wasn't a good role model, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I've described accurately in the book. So you know, I don't think he likes the book because uh, you know it is a, it's, it's very much a mirror, um, and and he has apologised. You know, which I suppose is a nice thing. It's taken a long time, but he has apologised for some of the way he's behaved. But, I mean, the, the irony is a lot of the positive role models for me as I grew up were police officers. So, um, you know, which probably explains a lot. Um, you know, in, in terms of male role models and how they behaved and what they were like, you know, the, the police officers. So there was um, a guy who was a sergeant who was a school's liaison officer. who used to come out with us on school trips. And he was just somebody I very admired and respected, the local cop in the area. Was was a, an important figure, 
Um, and I was in Crawley in Sussex, so you know it wasn't. It was a new town, and an overspill of, of population from London. But I mean, the local cop was very friendly to me, um, a very good role model. And you know, you you look around as 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 somebody black, but what 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 there weren't there weren't, weren't any black role models. And when I was in the police, you know, one one of the reasons why there were low expectations of black officers was because there weren't any black officers at the top. There'd never been a black chief constable. So other people's expectations were, were very low as well. Because, you know, when I once said I want to be a chief constable, people said, well, that's silly. You know, there's never been one. And there's, there's not any that they could point to or I could point to and say, I want to be like them. So, um, yeah, it, it affects people's expectations, not only those of the individuals like myself, but, but also other people's expectations. Um, so, you know, model, what I'm saying is role models are really important, I, I think, um, for, for everybody. And, and people like you that um, are, you know, the type of person that pushes through to be the first, as if without a first, there won't be a second <laughs> or any other. To be, so. to be honest, uh, what, I, what I thought was more important was um, to be very good at my job. So I, I was more concerned about that. I mean, it helped. I was absolutely passionate about it. I mean, some people came to work and it was just a job. Mm -hmm. I thoroughly enjoyed the, the work. And it, it was a career, it was a vocation. Um, as you see in, in lots of other areas of life, whether it's healthcare, you know, people are, you know, really, um, they, they really see what they're doing as a vocation. And I, I did. Um, and then... Um, I, I, I often felt that, you know, I wanted another challenge. Um, and, you know, not everybody feels that, but I did. So I, I would go for promotion. Um, but I didn't see myself getting very, you know, going right to the top. I wanted to be a dog handler, actually, when I first joined. <laughs> Which is why you can't plan your careers, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to the new generation of leaders that we'd hope, certainly after... The situation we're in now that people are thinking differently and want to get out there and make a change what would what would you say to somebody who you know wants to kind of push forward and try and do something positive in their community or in their career well i, th I think the first thing is recognizing your passion and not being put off by other people uh, in following and pursuing that passion that's really important and clearly with me in terms of getting promotion one, one of the things that was so important was that I felt that I wouldn't give anyone any excuse at all. So I, I did a lot of extra study um, and personal study. You know, a lot of that I paid for, but I did a lot of study in my own time, partly to, to get the qualification. So that was one of the reasons, but also to increase my knowledge so that I would actually be very professional in, in what I was doing. Um, there were some areas, like even just managing staff, where um, despite the training the police had given, I, I needed more knowledge. So I went off and did a, a master's degree in business, which I, I paid for. And it took me five years to, to do that in my own time. Um, but I, I was studying as well to increase my knowledge and experience and competence. I didn't want anybody saying, well, yeah, he just got there because he was black. But I was very ably qualified and, and often better qualified than other people I was competing with. And... You know, that, that was all important. I didn't feel, and, and nobody was going to do me any favours. So I think, you know, if you go around with that in mind, that yeah. nobody's going to do you any favours. <laughs> and you can't give anyone any excuse for saying no. And, and also it meant I had more knowledge. So when I was promoted, I, I'd, I'd actually have a lot of knowledge um, that I could fall back on that was actually very helpful. And I, I, think, I think the other thing is that I was always open to ideas. So... Um, and always had ideas and was prepared to challenge in a respectful way. Be critical. So even the, the setting up the BPA, you know, is very much about, well, there, there's a need for this support organisation. You know, there, there is a need for it. And whilst, whilst, you know, some people said, well, they don't, didn't think there was a need for it, um, you know, all, all the BAME staff recognised that there was, which mm. is why it's still, and, and I mean, sadly, there's still a need for it. Yeah. Um, because there's still a need for that discreet support for BAME staff. But, yeah, you know, that, that was something that was seen as critical, that this guy's criticising the organisation. And I was fortunate that the person at the top saw that it, it was important. 
people more um, middle mid ranking um, saw me as a threat, and it meant you know it affected how I was treated by my immediate bosses. The fact I was involved in setting up this uh, union, black union, is was how it's described. Black power organisation was how it's described, wow. and it wasn't that at all. So um, yeah, but I mean the thing is, if, if you're constructive, respectful, offer constructive, respectful challenges to your organisation, that's very different to just being somebody who's difficult to manage, and it's a very difficult balance to strike. But it's just not accepting sort of the status quo. Uh, and that things can get better, and, yeah. and seeing that. And, and that applies personally as well, is that we can always learn. So, I mean, the humility comes from the fact that, you know, I enjoyed learning. Um, and I wouldn't describe myself as an academic, but I've passed a lot of academic exams. And that's because I just enjoy the learning process and recognise that I can always learn. Um, so what what message would you have for anyone who's thinking about uh, a career in, in policing um, from a, a black uh, perspective uh, or a black, you know, if you're black and you want to join the police um, in, in terms of why there, there's a need? Yeah, I mean, go. what I'd say is go in with eyes wide open, uh, speak to BAME staff about their experiences and their experience, and their experiences are very different and varied. Um, you know, where some people have had negative experiences, some people have had positive experiences and never had any problems at all. So, you know, don't assume that, you know, if you go in, you're going to have problems. Um, but go in with the eyes wide open from having spoken to, to other, other, other staff. So, and uh, in, in going into a police career, it's not all going to be rosy, um, but, it, but it can be very rewarding as, as well in, in terms of, you know, what you do for others and the help and support you can give for others. If that's how you're motivated, you're motivated by money, well, it's the wrong thing to do. But I mean, if you're <laughs> motivated by, you know, what you can give and bring to others, then yes. you, you will find it very, very rewarding. And if you want a vacation, you'll, you'll find it very rewarding. And I, I had a brilliant career, I mean, with all the upsides. So I, I went through periods, as a lot of people do and will do, of uh, bad times, I've, I've been through, um, you know, the bereavement. I've been through disappointments in not getting promotions. Um, you know, not everything is going to go well. And I think, I think the reassuring thing is that you always come out the other side um, and you do come out stronger. You, you know, there's no question about that for me. I mean, the, I've graphically and honestly described what happened to me in the book. But the point being that I, I, did, I did come through it in a, in a very positive way. And I feel positive about having overcome, you know, quite difficult challenges in the career. So, but I mean, the, yeah, it's important to remember that it wasn't all rosy and I didn't just sort of go up the ranks and it was all, and come out the other end. It, it was very tough and lots of setbacks and, and disappointments. But, you know, I think the, the measure of success is how you deal with those setbacks and disappointments and whether you let people damage you or not. Um, you know, you keeping your dignity when you have those disappointments and uh, realising you are a worthwhile person and, and not letting other people sort of undermine you. Um, because I've, I've been through bullying, you know, I face racism, extreme racism, I would say, um, both within and outside the police. But the point being is I, I've, I've come through all that and feel sort of very positive about having come through that and survived it all. You've taken some. Th you, you've taken the negatives, and you've 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 brought something positive out of it. Yeah, um, and, yeah, yeah. So, which is hard to do, isn't it? But I mean, yeah, you know, I feel very positive about having come through it. You know, Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and more important, you know, I, I have um, as part of BPA, I did a lot of mentoring of, of, of others. I mean, I, I just haven't had time now, but I mean the. Um, you know, part of that was was helping others and bringing others through um, the the challenges that, that I'd, I'd I'd faced and, and come across. And I'm hoping the book will um, inspire a lot of young people. So the title of the book's changed. Just bear with me one sec. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 book was interesting actually because the um, the publishers had the problem that they um, I, I I was obviously passionate about the title. But I mean, the, 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 a lot of women in particular, when they go into the bookshop, 
they felt very awkward about taking the book off the shelves in case people thought they were some sort of far right sort of racist reading a book about how to kill the black one first. Uh, and of course, it's not not a title that that um, it's not a title that was made up by the publishers. You know, I, I keep um, in my defence say, well, this is a quote. You know, yeah. But I mean, the, people have found it very awkward. You know, and if you're sitting on the tube reading it. The, a lot of people had challenges and said, well, why are you reading that? Or what's that about? And it started a conversation in, in a way that a search for belonging just, just is not the same. You know, it's not, not the same. It's not as contentious. Um, but it's, it's, yes, exactly. I, know, I think it's great, you know, brilliant design and, and eye-catching. And it sold 7,000 copies. And that, um, but, I mean, the, the, the softback, uh, they're hoping will we'll sell more because people won't be shy about reading it. Truth. Some be far from the truth, further from the truth, rather. And the, they, um, they were absolutely fascinated all the way through. And at the end of the hour, they, um, they were queuing up and saying, you've got to write a book. And I said, oh, you know, well, there's <laughs> a lot of work involved in writing a book. And they, they said, no, no, you've got to, you've got to. So about 10 people queued up and were late for their next lecture uh, oh. in saying, you've got to write a book. So that's yeah. how it was born, really. Um, yeah. Uh, you know that um, you know, and, and they they said the story is is inspirational. You yeah, know, that they they need, and I think you do need the inspiration. I was inspired by other people. There was Norwell Gums, who, who was the first black officer. He had a really hard time, um, but he was an inspiration to me. You know, there'd be various people, uh, but there aren't there aren't many black male role models in in particular. There's Michelle Obama, who's who's a uh, a, a black inspirational role model, but there, there are very few. I feel the people who you know, I would say, well, I want to be like them. Mm. Mm. And you do need them. It gives hope. You know, it gives hope to everybody. We need that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I and mean, so people aren't confused. The, yeah. the 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 new title of the paperback, which is cheaper anyway, yeah. is is um is a search for belongings. So that's the one you um. So on the net. Otherwise, people end up confused. You can't get the hard that now. Yeah, um, that's out of my hands. You know, I'm dealt with it. But I mean, the Sean, Sean's so, excited because yeah. he's got because he's got one. Yeah, <laughs> I think my daughter does as well. So she's going to be happy to hear that. <laughs> it's, it's quite, that's, that's what I, I want to do: is inspire, particularly you know, the future generations. Yeah, and and have something every Black History Month to say. Well, read the book. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah. Thank you. And yeah. you. You've definitely inspired us, and I'm sure you, you can continue to inspire this future genera generation. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. I haven't finished it yet, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah, well, keep going, keep going. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, tell, you, I won't tell you the ending, other than I don't no. die. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've given it away there. <laughs> you've, you've answered lots of things for me and like I said, I, I feel really inspired and I just really want to thank you again for um, giving me the time. I feel honoured that you've uh, done this podcast with me today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you yeah, so much, Mr Fuller. Yeah, and, sure. um, yeah. and yeah, we'll, um, we'll definitely be promoting the book as well going forward. Great. Yeah, and thanks very much. Yeah, You're welcome. Take yeah. care. Bye. Bye. I was there, I was there